Hey, Patrick. Hey, Michael J. Modern. It True. is. It is a format. It is a. Uh, it is. It is on fire. This format is so hot. It is alive and popping. We had three different, like the three biggest tournaments of the weekend, were all modern, and they were all on different continents, and they were all totally different meta game. Well, mostly different meta games, and with like, tw- like, there were something like twenty nine decks in the top thirty two of the of the three different events. Talk about a format full of different options. Uh, but yeah, fire is uh, I, fire is a pretty big part of it. Yeah, I, I like to. I personally like to focus on the the heat of modern, perhaps. Mm. Uh, I speak, of course, of the burning rage that occurred in Birmingham. What do you? What was, do you that, was that your favorite deck of the weekend? No. I actually am furious about it, but I love burn decks. So, I, uh... so, so uh, something that you've talked about in previous weeks is the, uh, you know, like something like 56 of the cards in the burn deck are kind of mostly solved. Yeah. You know, like you can, it depends. I mean, if you want, you can consider like Searing Blaze, Skullcrack to be sort of like, you know, but like once you're playing white then like you know your first 56 come fairly naturally (laughs) the the last four that's usually where we find out the like the real texture of the pilot we find out what this person's really made of what's inside of them and apparently lebron is full of burning rage yeah so this is the main deck down to the four arid mesas that I cannot stand, right, are, uh, are the, I guess I would say, like, 56 of the, the main deck are the, the default kind of deck that uh, came out of the regional championships last year. And it was kind of the one that, that people, you know, when they put the screenshots up in, in between, well, this is what this archetype looks like on, on coverage. But there's no Eidolon of the Great Revel in main deck or sideboard of this deck. Instead, Shrine of Burning Rage. And I, I can't even wrap my head around this. As someone who, who thinks about just dealing two points of damage at a time, I just I don't, tell me about this. Can you, can you wrap your head around this? If I'm going to take on yeah. Eidolon, I would think about putting, like, Forked Bolt in, something that lowers curve, or even splashing a color for bump in the night. But I, it's, I don't know. I, uh, it, it fills me with burning rage to see this. So to start with, I don't know. Like I don't know about all this hatred of Eric Mesa. He's got a stomping ground, and he's doing it in order to support the destructive revelries out of the sideboard. I actually like destructive. I mean, if like once you're going down this path, right? Like I don't. I don't know that it's like. I, I'm not me personally. I'm not a lava spike guy. So but that, I think what, I hate Eric Mesa. It's not because I hate having twelve fetches or whatever. I just think it should be scalding tarn. The, the, I don't know, man. On a signaling basis, Aired Mesa is it's like mathematically the worst thing you can play in a burn deck, but that's a different topic. I, you, no, you say that, you say that, but like the worst thing you could do is play uh four Mesa, three Blood Mire, four Wooded Foothills, and zero Scalding Tarn instead of just a little, slightly more even of a split for the double Pithing Needle games. Yeah, I mean, I guess you have a point there. I think if I, I'm just talking about, you're right. You're actually 100% right, Patrick. Obviously, is, that's why I said it. There is a... Actually, I guess that this is a Bayesian question, right? Do you lose more double pithing needle ones, or do you win more on first turn arid mesa bluffs? That's actually the question. I don't know what the right answer is. But I think that we can't solve this in the course it of depends. this podcast. It depends. It depends. It depends. If it's you, you're not getting much edge from playing a scalding turn turn one. The jig is up. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Everyone if, knows if it's me... If it's me, yeah. and I put a scalding turn down, turn one, you get and then on my so end step, on. both them, they'll be like, okay, they'll you know raise an eyebrow. If, but then when I skull crack them on the next turn, they're going to be like, what the hell no, happened? No, 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 no. You play an arid mesa on, I'm sorry, uh, if you play, you, Patrick Chapa, play a scalding turn on turn one, they crack their fetch for a for an untapped <laughs> shock land so fast, and you are pumping inwardly. It's just, It's so great. If oh, I do man. it, they're like... No, 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 no. If it's me, they're going to be... They're not going to even want to crack the fetch wing because I'll stifle them. 
Although I guess it's not. It's more, you know, once it's modern, we're going to have to wait so I can shadow and doubt him. But. Point being, you and I, as uh, you know, our, our table reputations uh, come far enough in front of us that we will get different mileage out of a Scalding Tarn on the first turn. Yeah, anyway. I don't know, man. I think Shrine of Burning Rage is, uh, I mean, it's not intuitive me, to me why you would want to do this. But, like, uh, I could imagine that, like, if people were not prepared for it, you know, it might just steal you some games. I mean, it seems insane in fair matchups, but I don't think that this deck Does has it? A, yeah, I mean, yeah, like, when I say fair matchups, like I mean, what? you play it, and then, like, if you're not going to do anything to it for X turns and you just keep building counters on it, then it's worth three cards. But I just, I, I would never want to top deck wait, it. Wait, 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 wait. I'm trying to understand which fair matchups, the ones full of abrupt decays or the ones full of Culligan's commands. Okay, I'm going to revise my statement and go back to my just filling my own heart with Burning Rage. It's not insane in fair matchups. I really don't know when I would ever want it. I, do I, was, want it against, I don't do you know. Want it against all, do you want it against all these Coco decks with Casali Pride Mages? In maybe fact, I would rate maybe this you want card, it against Jund, where they also have Maelstrom Pulse. In I addition would to actually K. rate this card as, if I draw this card, I might actually lose to a Tarmogoyf deck, which is that's the lowest statement I would make about a modern burn deck. I'm just mm. I I would I look at this and I'm like, eh, I might just lose to Tarmogoyfs. And maybe it's maybe it's against the Geist of Saint Traff decks. You are yeah. you are not reversing my opinion on Shrine of Burning Rage here. It's and it's so bad to top deck. That's the thing that I I don't I don't understand about it. This is a deck that has no manipulation. You Maybe basically have to look at your opening combo. hand. And, no, it's horrible <laughs> against Storm Combo. It's horrible against Death Shadow. Okay, can you imagine a worse card to draw against Death Shadow? Like oh yes, my, my opponent can kill me in two swings, but I'm going to play a card that has no text but has five mana attached to it. Like how does that? help you against a deck that can attack you literally in two attacks. I think a Tothacon Worm would be worse against Death Shadow. <laughs> uh, of the of the cards that would reasonably be played in a burn deck. Well, I mean, you can play. I, you've got the white and the green mana. You probably need a little bit more green You don't have green enough mana. green. <laughs> well, Actually, I don't know. How much does that worm cost? Like 13? You don't have enough <laughs> man producing land 14? to cast it. Who knows? You don't have enough. I don't think you have enough mana producing land. Because well, anyway, it, well, the, the thing is, you can get it on the cheap. It has convoke. The problem <laughs> is that most of your creatures are red. Now you can sideboard in some white creatures, and that does help. But triple green is the real bottleneck here. Yeah, considering there's one stomping ground. The nice thing is that if you get the first two in play, the third and fourth one are easier to come by. Ugh. Back to the Briad's actual burn deck. Seriously, what I I I can't I can't wrap my head around that card. I mean, obviously the other fifty six cards, I'm like I'm in, great. But if if you're, I I just think of Idolon of the Great Revel as like one of the strongest cards you can actually play in the modern format. If I were gonna cut it, I can't see for cutting it for another two mana spell, especially one with so little impact. That's the that's where I am. Just, just one in a burn deck. Got. In a burn deck, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I don't know, man. This is your wheelhouse. I trust your judgment. I know when I look at Shrine of Burning Rage, it's a, uh, you know, a, it's it's a surprising twentieth to drop to the party. Like I would have guessed that Idolana the Great Revel would have made my top twenty. <laughs> I'm not trying you to like the make card fun. that like you play it on the second turn, you just win out of you know against half the just average or worse i don't know you say that but i'm like 12 and 0 lifetime against i don't the great rebels so really yeah i i don't know you've only played against it 12 times i think so i don't know i think so yeah i think my edge varies i beat eidolons a lot but when i have eidolons i my opponents get beat so that's i don't know nice nice they they like me so i don't know man I know you're. You always got a, a soft spot for burn decks, but like, uh, it doesn't sound like you like the uh, the new tech of this particular burn deck this weekend. Yeah, I just I don't understand how it works. That's I the thing. It works by every time 
you take a turn every time you play a spell it's stacking up if you don't get, if it doesn't get blown up it's sick right like if your opponent is playing a slower deck right like if you draw off the top it sucks if your opponent destroys it it sucks if your opponent counters it it sucks if your opponent wins the race it sucks but if your opponent's playing a fair deck and they can't destroy it the card's unreal and yeah I, but like you it needs so much time like that's the thing there are games that are decided you never even draw a third land that's okay. the Okay, like, different different burn deck for you. Yeah. As interesting as it is to hear you rant about Shrine of Burning Rage, I already got to listen to you rant about Lava Spike as it is. I love Lava Spike. I know. I know you do. So here's a burn deck for you. It's Kaju uh, Negri, Negri's burn deck from the Modern Open in Richmond. Um, apologize for butchering the name, but uh, what did you think of his burn deck? Uh, I'm I'm just flipping over it to make sure I uh... yeah yeah so it's it's uh I it's got a different two drop burn spell grape shot which works really well with all of the you know the desperate ritual the pyretic ritual what did what did what did passed you in flames first goblin electromancer barrel chief of compliance apostle's blessing is kind of the sick new tech. Oh, I was looking at the classic. I apologize. Okay. Um, yeah, this is not a burn deck. This is a storm deck. Dude, it has grape shot. It wins with burn. I, first of all, Brrr, grape shot. It should surprise you, Zero, that I have a bit of a soft spot in my heart for this deck. Also, John Finkel keeps a copy of this of this deck on his coffee table. Th these are truth stories about John Finkel. Number one, he keeps a copy of this deck on his coffee table at all times so that he could just take test draws with it when he's doing nothing else or like watching TV. He just loves it. So um, there's that. And then he also has a copy of Decade on his nightstand so he could look at that before he goes to sleep. Um, of course, I I can relate to that, by the way. I yeah. can relate. About once every three years, I just proxy up uh the deck that i played at uh at the um at the team championship in uh, at origins uh i had to play the type 1 portion and it was during the like 3 week period where you could play with lion's eye diamond as black lotus 2 through 5 yeah and i also just got to play with uh you know as many Tinkers and memory jars and Yog Moss wills and wind. I mean, my deck was just like there were only two games the entire tournament that lasted more than a turn. <laughs> well, yeah, uh, that's so fun. I take test draws of that. I just it's fun, the right? Up. It is. There's something very cathartic. It's very. I mean, you got to go back to your roots sometime. You got to, you know, find what you love and embrace it. You know, I, I took a lot of test draws with the blue white. Approach of the Second Sons deck last week at my desk, but it's not quite the same thing. I mean, it is as long as you win on the first turn every time. Yeah, you don't. You win on like the ninth turn with that deck. We just try to see like ninth deck, that ninth I used to play with Brian Demar some, although I guess play is kind of a weird word. Brian Demars and I would sometimes take turns, yeah. seeing how many games in a row we could win on the first turn. So it's like, can you like, oh, today's high score is nine. How how many can you do in the first turn? You know, Kazu's deck can't win until like the third turn. Yeah. So there's a couple cool things to note here. Um, obviously, since Burral Chief of Compliance has dropped, there's been uh, has come out. There's been a lot of, you know, it's been basically you know instantly universally adopted in storm decks, and it's given them a real big power level boost. That you can actually reliably play one of these guys that makes all your rituals unreal. Yeah. So is, uh, oh, go ahead. Just to, just from a mechanical standpoint, there was been a blue red kind of storm or or past in flames deck in modern for quite a long time, right? And mm -hmm. the innovation maybe about was it five years ago uh, was Goblin Electromancer, and that creates a fork for the opponent, right? If you're the storm deck, you play it on the second turn. If they let you untap with it. Like you just said, uh, the, your You're rituals dead. become insane, and you you probably just win on the spot, right? Uh, all you do because your card drawing is also becomes insane. Um, and you know, if you have some card like Metamorphose, it's card drawing and rituals, and it, you know, it's 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 great. Um, but the opponent is also given this opportunity to kill the Goblin Electromancer, 
which is kind of also great because you know you don't win on the spot, but they took their turn off to kill it, right? So it's it's really and their mana's capped off. Yeah, it's really so non-intuitively, deceptively powerful to have a random two-two in your combo deck on the second turn. But Baral is kind of even better because it has three toughness, making it a little bit more difficult to kill, right? Uh, that's only part of it. Though. Well, and then he has that whole second line of text. <laughs> the, the interaction with Remand is nice. You know, like when you play a, uh, like if, if your opponent has a lot of interaction, you don't just necessarily drop Burrow on turn two and just walk straight into a uh, into a lightning bolt or something. Sometimes what you can do is just go Burrow, uh, then Remand their lightning bolt. And even if they kill the... The uh, the even if they're able to just replay the lightning bolt and kill it, which sometimes they won't be able to because it's not always going to be a one cost spell. Sometimes it's it's you know lightning helix or whatever. But uh, getting to, getting that extra loot is a big deal when you play with the graveyards. You know graveyard synergies like past in flames, and uh, it's 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 also just kind of nice being able to remand for just one mana anyway. And with four barrel and three goblin electromancer, you can reliably. Uh, you know, you're you're going to have one of those cards fairly reliably, and whether you play it on turn two, and get them to take their turn off trying to react to that, or if you just wait and set things up, because another thing you can do is just hang out and wait, and then gifts on turn four, and when you drop Electromancer on turn five, even if they already have removal, you can just keep casting more rituals in response. Yeah, so mechanically, the, you know, you've laid out a bunch of things that are, I think, really important to understand if you're playing the Blue-Red Storm deck in Modern. One of them is your own second turn, whether or not you're going to play a Goblin Electromancer or a you know, Brawl Chief of Compliance. Uh, you know, just If you've got a remand, for example, and you're on the play, you might not want to play one because you might just be like want to use your remand to counter their Explore or their, probably not trying to Burning Rage, but you know some other high impact two that they might cast right uh and then you get the opportunity to just play your creature on turn three with a blue open or you know maybe a dual land open and then you still have that remand opportunity so it's that's really powerful um you know conversely if you've got a gifts and you think there's a low low likelihood that your creature is going to die maybe you do want to cast it on turn two because if you if you basically untap and gifts with one of these creatures and it's actually still in play on turn four after your gifts is resolved, they're probably dead, right? So, um, you know, just flexible play on, on turn two, depending on if you have a remand and if you went first and if you care what they actually do on their second and ter- third turns. Yep, 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 yep. Uh, the other fun thing is with the Apostle's Blessing, the Miser's Apostle's Blessing. Yeah, that's admirable, right? Being able to play Apostle's Blessing for zero... It's kind of sneaky. It's great. You know, you like you play your barrel on turn two or your Goblin Electromancer, and then you just, boom, zero mana, force you, of will, boom. You really have to respect somebody who, instead of just playing the eighth creature, plays one Apostle's Blessing, right? Like, um, you know, this, this warms my heart. It's like back in the day, we only had Blinding Angel and, and uh, Magetta the Lion and still just played like three Chomano's Blessing. Because if, if those guys lived, your opponent was stuck. Yep, yep, yep. So, uh, I don't know. What do you think of this build? I like it. Um, you know, I think that... It, I think Modern is just like this gigantic sandbox. You can do so many different things. And, you know, what what ends up winning in a particular week or a particular tournament is so, I think, matchup dependent. And there's so many possible matchups because there's no single dominant strategy right now. Um, uh, what do you think of Pure Through Depths? Pure think, Through Depths as an extra arcane card is kind of interesting. Well, the Desperate Ritual action, right? Yeah, I like it. I mean, I think when I've played with these kind of cards in these kind of formats, you know, versus you know trying to play them in standard, for example, I think that you get the you get the what's it called splice to arcane very mm-hmm. very rarely. I don't know. Maybe I'm greedy, but I get it sometimes. I set it up. Yeah, I It'll think. Take- in modern, you think it it, it, it comes up? A well, lot? I'm just telling you historically. I, was, uh, I don't know about a lot. I, you know, <laughs> less than one percent. <laughs> <laughs> so not that commonly, right? It's like not, not that common. So it's a, I think a parallel situation in terms of your greed is like when you set up 
uh, in standard, when you set up a mono red deck and you fumigate them, leaving them only hazard, or like they play hazard post fumigate, and do you have a, a blessed alliance in your hand, and you're and you think for a second. Should I take this Hazaret hit so that I could kick the Blessed Alliance next turn? Well, no, <laughs> taking five to gain back four doesn't really make a lot of sense. But you think about it. I, you know, I, people think about it. Um, mm -hmm. It's actually probably not a bad play if they have a second Hazaret, right? Like, you know, eat the five now and then, you know, you, you time walk them. But probably you should just, you know, use your Blessed Alliance because what if they have an Earthshaker Kenner the next turn or something? Um, yeah, I think it, to me it's similar to that. Yeah, this might come up, but probably you should just do your thing. So, what do you think of Jonathan Rossum, Rossum's uh, burn deck? Who he finished fifth at the Modern Open. His burn was primarily Lightning Bolt, Lightning Helix, Electrolyze, Geist of Saint Traft. So, your definition of a burn deck is unusually <laughs> broad this week. So, I would call this like a. A, a Jeskai, Jeskai tempo? Temp, yeah, Jeskai Tempo deck. Like this is like a burn deck. This, this deck is like a Tom Martell deck. Like not a. It is. Uh, is like except so that it, without Martell. lingering souls. Nah, without lingering souls. How Tom Martell could it be? This is like only like seventy five percent full Tom Martell. Yeah, I mean it's. But I like this deck. Don't get me wrong. I would be more than willing to play this deck. I think this deck again it. This just shows you the matchup dependencies in modern. If your opponent has blockers, like this deck loses a lot of value. If your opponent doesn't what have blockers, mean? they're dead. Dude, four path to exile, four lightning bolt, three lightning helix, three electrolyze, four cryptic command, four snapcaster mage, four spell queller. Dude, this deck is great against blockers. So That's not the problem. The problem is people who are not. Using blockers. <laughs> the problem is people who kill you when you tap out for Geist of St. Traft. Geist like, of St. Traft? All right. Dude, that's got to be so great, right? They're like Scalding Tarn, Arid Mesa, Go Go, and you're like, tap out for Geist of St. Traft. Does it resolve? Yup. You're like pumping the fist. They didn't mana leak your Geist of St. Traft. They're like, there's no reason to be pumping the fist, friend. <laughs> Dude, I seriously, though, I think this deck is kind of sweet. I like it. I, I, would totally I love it. Spellqueller in Modern. I think the card is so underplayed. I am very into Spellqueller. Uh, I love Spellqueller also. What do you think about Spellqueller in Standard in the sideboard of Approach of the Second Sons? What do you think about that? Uh, if I somehow got stuck playing a blue-white Approach of the Second Sons deck, I would probably play Spellquellers in my sideboard. I agree. I as someone who got stuck playing it last week and was happy to be thus stuck, I think that Spellqueller is a sweet addition that people haven't started really exploring yet. But now they will. <laughs> this is the turning point. You heard it here This first. is the spot. This is where the blue-white control decks that are short on creatures finally think to cyborg in Spellqueller. You don't know, like when the opponent taps out for a... You know, for a card that costs I, four yeah, or like less. Hieroglyphic illumination. Oh, so one of those. So good. Like, oh, so good. I'm gonna draw two cards. You're like, not only are you not gonna draw two cards, <laughs> but there's probably nothing in your deck that can remove this two, three. So I'm gonna kill you with it before you can get, cast fourteen Man, mana worth of spells. It is so wild. Why nobody's ever thought it. Like it's like they're like, oh. I'll just tap out to play a Hedron Archive or some other forecasting cost main phase card. Nobody's ever. No! They've never done it. No! You heard it I can't here. believe it. Spell Queller, how is this possible? I think that here, are... I, here I thought I was going to have to abrade the Torrential Gear Hulks you don't have, <laughs> but now it looks like I'm going to have to abrade the Spell Quellers instead. Dude, they don't have abrade. Stop your lies. They don't have that card. No yes. one has that. You know what card I like a lot in this deck, actually? Are you going to invent a braid, too? <laughs> what do you like you a lot? invent a braid. A braid's like a four of in every deck. I'm reinventing Spellqueller in a deck that didn't have it last week. Disdainful Stroke. How great is Disdainful yes. Stroke? How I agree with you on that. That card, oof, I love it in this deck. I love Ceremonious Rejection in this deck. I love, like, mixing it up with, with uh, you know, the new counter or new-ish any uh. counter spells. I'm okay. I'm. I'm. Ceremonious rejection is fine. I'm not going to reject it. 
out of hand, but I think that disdainful stroke is is really got me all in a tizzy. It's and of nice, course right? dispel is good, but dispel yeah, disdainful stroke is is hot, hot, hot. I am dropping a primeval titan with that so hard. Whew. Or an Elsbeth, like something really filthy. Yeah, so uh, I'm a fan. I'm a fan of this list. I do think three logic knots is the spot at which you know somebody is serious. One, they got the memo. Two, you know, it it raises an eyebrow. Three, it is clear at this point that you're dealing with a professional. (laughs) Logic Knot's a little bit of a toughie, isn't it? Like, UU no. isn't the easiest. I mean, I'm not saying it's the hardest. This deck certainly has a lot of ways to get to you, right? But so it, I, guess, I guess you're just Logic Knotting for one a lot. Through right? my stomach. Through my stomach. That's the best way for this deck to get to me. My heart is already taken. Jace the Mind Sculptor. I miss you. Although, honestly, it's nice seeing Elspeth at the top. I love it. So what yeah. do you think about the anger of the gods in this deck versus, say, in the um, in the top eight of uh, the Birmingham Grand Prix? There's sweltering suns in the Titan Shift deck. That's like a new, new, brand new card in in a these cards. You know, very, very comparable in terms of their impact. Well, I mean, here, so in the Just Guy uh, Tempo deck, we were just looking at. Rosam had uh, his Anger of the Gods in the sideboard, which is the right place for Anger of the Gods right now. Well, in and a deck that has the, Dice the Saint Trap, Spellcaller, no, no, and Snapcaster Mage? But the Titan Shift deck uh, used well, one of them. So Becky Adelman's list had three Anger of the Gods, right? But, like, uh, Simon Nielsen's list had sweltering sun's main deck with anger of the gods in the sideboard so like i i personally i don't mind it depends on your metagame i don't mind sweltering sun's main deck but i certainly would take anger of the gods in the sideboard i think it's just too valuable the strength against voice of resurgence against kitchen finks Again, you know, that like and just making it so that Eternal Witness can't rebuy parts of the Obzon Coco deck, you know? So I think one of the things about And that's not even counting dredge. If you're yeah, there's these are two different cards that cost three that deal three to all the creatures, right? Anger the gods, whenever you have it in your deck, so these are both cases, both in the Titan Shift sideboard and in the Jeskai Tempo sideboard, that it's coming out of the out of the sideboard into the deck, you always know that you it, it means business, right? Like it, it's just additional value against Kitchen Finks, et cetera, but it means business. You want to sweep. If you're going to play one in the main deck, maybe Sweltering Suns is an option because you don't always want to sweep. Like you're playing against Storm or something. Actually, I guess it's not the worst against Storm, but it's not great either. And, you know, you're playing against, you know, some deck that might not have, you know, go wide or small creatures. You want to get rid of it, and the cycling has some value there. I'm a little skeptical, though. Man, cycling three in modern is not not where I want to be, but... I, I I think I see the the argument. So one of the reasons why I thought uh, Becky's list was actually uh, real smart for the modern or for the uh, Richmond metagame uh, at the Open, uh, if you if you look at the top tables, each of the metagames was fairly different between Sao Paulo, Birmingham, and Richmond. Richmond specifically featured. Uh, much more Eldrazi Tron than Birmingham or Sao Paulo. And Anger of the Gods, very nice for being able to take out uh, Mattery Shaper, you know, like compared to Sweltering Suns. And then uh, several of the Jeskai decks in Richmond were playing Geist of St. Traft, which is kind of nice having three sweepers instead of only one or zero like a lot of people. Oh, this deck is kind of helpless if it doesn't get rid of the guys the turn that it's tapped out, right? Like, there, it has very few ways to to deal with it once they have, like, Cryptic Command online the next turn, right? Right. And then finally, uh, the U.S. metagame just has, uh, you know, a fairly reasonable chunk of uh, their company decks are using stuff like Voice of Resurgence, you know? Hmm. So... I mean, some of the counter, the people, like, so Birmingham and Sao Paulo had a lot more counters company, and the counters company decks are much more frequently only sideboarding the uh, Voice of Resurgences instead of main decking it. But, 
So anyway, uh, I I thought it was a it was a reasonable choice for uh, the Richmond metagame, and uh, I I also think Sweltering Suns is not a bad choice either because, you know, like over in Birmingham, you're dealing with a, a lot more odds on mid range and a lot more uh, just you know, like some decks that you don't necessarily want it against. Like you don't totally, I mean, it's not the worst, but you don't really want it against a lava spike deck. It's not like you want to cycle either, but like sometimes it's nice just to be move, you know, move the, like just move towards your escape shift or try to, you know, combo off a turn earlier. I think both those cards are pretty bad against lava spike. Obviously you want to get to your escape shift. Um, the, the thing that's interesting to me, if you if you compare Becky's deck to the Birmingham deck, like the some of the individual card choices, especially the more recent cards, are really surprising to me. Right? Like, um, I guess Becky's deck has Chandra Torch Defiance, which is kind of an accelerator, right? Um, but then, I mean, kind of, it's very it's, much an okay, it's very much an accelerator, especially you hit second turn Sakura Tribe Elder, right? But if you compare that to uh, Simon or Nielsen's Farseek? deck. Farseek, you know, or, or explore, or explore Farse- sure. Roast, lightning bolt, the three lightning bolts, two roasts, a sub. No, uh, no, 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 no. They're more similar than they look. So uh, Nielsen's list with two roasts, a sweltering sun, and three lightning bolt. That's six interaction pieces, right? Yeah. That's six removal spells. Becky's got three uh, anger of the gods and three path to exile. It's the same thing. It's the same shell. And you're like, oh, what about Becky's one Chandra? And it's like, oh, what about Nielsen's one Pia and Kieran Noir? I think they're I more like, similar than they look. I think I like the Chandra better than the Pia and Kieran Noir. I like Chandra. I think Chandra's dope. I think because like, you have so many twos, right? You go like Sakura Tribe Elder, Explore Farseek into Chandra. If the Chandra lives, that just really helps you land Primeval Titan or even Thrag Tusk, right? What if you're stuck? It'll. It'll it'll hit. What about prismatic omen? Is that just like? Uh, I think I don't know. It's, it's okay. Just, I think it's just cheats. It's just cheats. So the nice thing about one prismatic omens yeah. is that it adds this extra dimension. So prismatic omen can help you win even without primeval titan. Prismatic omen can help you uh, occasionally just win a turn earlier. You know, like if you have prismatic omen with scape shift, you can you can do it faster oh, yeah. than average. And. Uh, you can also just sometimes grind people who are like fighting you tit for tat. If you just put out an omen early, sometimes you can just get them. Yeah, just you can just, out. you could just drop them out and it, like whatever. Verdant Catacombs is like a bunch of damage, right? If you if you just have you know Val couldn't play in Prismatic Omen, everything just becomes a lightning bolt. It's a. Uh, I think that that's how I liked it a lot in the Wargate deck. I don't know if you remember that deck, but yep. Um, but, but the Wargate deck actually needed the Prismatic Omen. I, I just I think that it's more crutchy than I would want in a in a modern Titan Shift deck right now because there's so many other tools. That's that's the thing. Like, it, eh, maybe I'm wrong. Dude, Rurik Thar the Unbowed. Rurik Thar the, si- the un- in Becky's deck, right? Yeah, in the sideboard, which is the uh, four red green six six vigilance reach Rurik Thar the Unbowed attacks each turn if able. <laughs> and he is. Yes. And whenever a player casts a non-creature spell, Rourke Thar deals six damage to that player. Face. Yeah, this is a this is a threat. <laughs> you play it, they take six, right? Like their their options are taking six. Not necessarily. It has to right? tag. I mean, unless they've got like a seven seven in play or something already. Dude, like if you have Rourke Thar the Unbowed. Uh, you really just hope your opponent doesn't reflect your mage it. You know, like, that's just such a big tempo hit. Um, yes, I would agree. Uh, I don't know. I, planes in the sideboard is actually a little surprising to me, and I'm a guy who's played planes in the sideboard of multiple Pro Tour decks. But, like, we're talking about a, a list where the only white cards are three path to exiles, is it really? It's got to be for engineered explosives, right? Like that's got to be the reason to have the planes in the sideboard, right? I mean, I guess there's an art you may make that where you're like, I just want to have an extra land in my sideboard for some reason. Uh, if I if I am getting, why would it not be like scavenger ground or because something, he, right? Because she can get the she can get the planes with Sakura Tribe Elder in a beatdown matchup, right? Like 
having a non-pain source of white that you can easily fetch for in this deck with Sakura Tri with Sakura Tri Builder, um, and Farseek, etc. Search for Tomorrow is actually pretty attractive against Beatdown. Like, yeah, I mean, Farsi can go anyway, go get Sacred Foundry, but I think that you're right. I think with Search for Tomorrow and Sir Kurt Trevor Elder, the combination of being able to get planes pain-free to cast Path to Exile, as well as being able to Explosives for three, which is actually legitimately, like, important. Like, when you're going to Blood Moons, you can't really win with Valakid anymore. Blood Moon is like a giant beating, right? Yeah, I'm, has... I'm just thinking, like, she could just have Search for Tomorrow on the first turn, and then the planes comes into play untapped, right? Like, that's... That's really attractive, like especially yeah, if she has like one of these weird draws that you have draw multiple path to exile. Yeah. Plus, I mean, yeah, I don't know. I think that just being able to explosives for three away the blood moon is is a big game. I'm sold. Uh, so over in oh, uh, yeah, actually, okay. the, just one other thing about this deck list. Well, two other things. I think that. It, it, just what you were saying before, like they were anticipating very different metagames. If you just look at the the way these two Titan Shift decks, I, 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 they're not even bullets, right? They're just these cards that they're playing that aren't central to their strategy. One deck has all these removal spells, and I guess he's, you said that they're, they're similar. No, they both have six. But this is like Relic of Progenitus, and uh, you know that the sideboard is a Chameleon Colossus. I love the Pulse of Marasa, though. I have to say, I think Pulse of Marasa is awesome in this sideboard. Um, you know, against mid-range matchups? Because they can actually remove your Primeval Titan, but then you just keep getting ahead. Kind of love it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the... Uh, it is a funny split. The difference between two Relic of Progenitus versus uh, the prospect of playing with a Thrag Tusk and a uh, an extra Farseek type of thing. Yeah, they're <laughs> very, very... It's actually a Thrag Tusk and three Farseeks versus two Relic of Progenitus and two Calney Heart Expedition. Calney Heart Expedition is another reason why Planes is Oh, no, no, I guess it's only... God, I guess Becky does have two Explore and two Farseek, but she's just got two Calney Heart Expedition instead of the third Explorer and the third Farseek. It, Calney Heart Expedition is really way. interesting. Like, that card is... Uh, it's extremely explosive, potentially, in a format where you have fetch lands. Um... What do you think about Cinderglade? That's that was that's a. I love a Cinderglade. Do you Dude, love Cinderglade three Cinderglades? Is, yeah. The question is: Is there any chance? Like we could see. I mean, I could imagine a Scape Shift deck with Stomping Ground, Cinderglade, and Scattered Groves. Do you see the cool thing about Cinderglade? Is uh, well, it's a couple things. What's a mountain? First, it is a mount. It's a green source that's actually a mountain for your scape shift, which is a big deal, right? Like that way. Like in the past, it's been a struggle to keep, you know, to have eleven mountains in your deck. With Cinderglade, thirteen is no problem. Next of all, Cinderglade uh, makes it so that you can uh, actually fetch up untapped duels easy, because this is a deck that can go get forests and mountains with no problem, right? And it's super nice to be able to keep fetching untapped duels every time you want to use them that turn. I think Cinderglade is fantastic here. I, I would play at least three. At least three. All right. That means that you would potentially play four. I would potentially play four. I think I would play four. I am very open to playing four Cinderglades. I think Cinderglade is fantastic in these decks. I, that's why I wasn't joking. I really do think that it's possible. I think that even though it's not nearly, you know, you're not fetching it up or whatever, I don't think it's out of the question to consider the uh, scattered groves. I just really like my green sources counting as mountains. Um, so what do you think of the, the Sao Paulo metagame? One of the things that struck me about it was how much it was actually the most reflective of the overall metagame. Both the modern Open and the GP in Birmingham were slightly polarized in different directions. Sao Paulo was uh, the closest to the overall picture. Um, what did you mean by that? Because there's like Grixis Death Shadow and like more... So Gr like, I mean, yeah, there are all these... Like they're almost like 
it, I think modern is just so wide. There's like, if you could just took a slice of each of these tournaments and you looked at them in isolation with not the knowledge that uh, they all occurred the same weekend, you might not even realize they were occurring at the same time, right? Like there, there's so many, there's there's so many different kind of shapes going on. Yeah, I mean the. The, like, for instance, Death Shadow is kind of the, the unifying thing. I mean, it is the best strategy in the abstract, and it was the only strategy that was at the top of, you know, like it was in the top couple from every, uh, from all three. But uh, Sao Paulo was the only GP where Death Shadow was like the biggest, uh, the biggest performer, uh, you know, deep in day two. But even there, it wasn't, uh, it didn't win. You know, like Death Shadow wasn't winning anywhere. I mean, it got to it put a lot of people in top eights and a lot of people in top thirty twos, but um, it you know in uh, in Brazil uh, there was uh, kind of Obzon is kind of you know that's another thing that was popping and you know I I don't know I think that the uh, the Obzon decks from uh, a lot of the uh, Portuguese and a lot of the Brazilian players uh, are often just further, like better tuned, like they're further evolved than a lot of the OBS on decks. Because I think we see a lot of people pick up OBS on decks that are just, oh, this is the OBS on deck from last week or two weeks ago. But they actually need to evolve a lot, like Grixis Control. Which is a long winded way of saying that, uh, yeah, Grixis Death Shadow, big everywhere. Big well, all let's, over. Let's take this one at a time. Let's look at Fabian Nunez's Obsan mid range from Sao Paulo, right? So there is a like, like you said, there's so many different ways that you can take Obsan and modern, right? One of them is to not play Siege Rhino. Uh, I think for the better part of last year when we were examining the modern metagame, we frequently saw four copies of Grim Flare, right, in, in Obsan decks. Uh, Fabian Nunez's deck has two Siege Rhinos in the main deck. Um, not four, uh, and a tireless tracker and no grim flares, right? So this is like far afield of um, you know some of the objects we might have seen eight months ago or something. Uh, is this what you mean? It's like very evolved. Is, is this the kind? Like, I, my understanding, and I haven't played this side of the matchup uh, ever. So, but it's just what I've heard is that C Drino based Obzon decks are good against Death Shadow decks. Uh, is that yeah. something you've heard? Yeah, that's my understanding as well. And and I don't know that I would even describe this as Siege Rhino based. The biggest, I mean, Siege Rhino it's, as a card is fantastic against those people. I mean, when their deck is like doing so much damage to themselves and they rely on, uh, you know, things like Lightning Bolts and Fatal Push. I mean, Fatal Push will often kill a Rhino, but the Rhino being able to give that extra racing, that extra speed. And that's not even counting if you face somebody with Abrupt Decay. Oh, I mean, just... But, all kidding aside, as a as a burn player, it's actually surprising how great Siege Rhino is against you in a fa- format as fast as Modern for two reasons. One, obviously, the life gain matters so much. It's a huge body that's hard to get past, but it costs four, so it doesn't trigger Eidolon. That's actually one of the big things about it. I, I also like the, the smart mix of different life gain. There's actually a deceptively large amount of life gain in, in Nunez's list with uh, not just the two Siege Rhinos and the three Scavenging Oozes, but also two shambling vents from his land and two collective brutalities, which it's a very real thing to collect a brutality for extra value against a burn deck. Absolutely. And then the cyborg containing kitchen finks and blessed Alliance, you know, like having extra life gain all over the place is, is important if you're actually going to be serious about beating a burn deck with a deck like this. Yeah. I think that this is actually a very well prepared, uh, Abzan deck for burn. Like one of the things that, uh, I like about Burn is that it's so good against mid-range decks in Modern, but I think that this would be very challenging to beat because of the scavenging oozes, the siege rhinos, all the different kinds of, of life gain, and especially those collective brutalities that you mentioned, right? So you can take out somebody's uh, goblin guide, take their best, you know, take their Boros Charm away, and then gain gain a little life all at once. Especially if you're discarding Lingering Souls, it's unreal. Now, if you look over on the other side in Birmingham... Uh, we we actually see a burn deck beat two Obzon decks on the way, or effectively Obzon decks on the way to taking down the the tournament. You know, uh, the top four list that uh, that Alberto Galicia 
played feature. It was a very different style. This is that Grim Flare, uh, that Grim Flare style that you were discussing earlier, but like with no Traverse the Ulven Wild, none of that kind of stuff, just uh, being extra long on removal. And uh, I, I mean, I think Kalidus is a is a very solid card in modern, but I think that relying on just three scavenging units and two Kalidus to gain life, because remember, this is a deck with no shambling vents. Uh, it has extra treetops instead. It's got no siege rhinos because it's not playing any white except for the lingering souls and the uh, sideboard stony silence that are kind of obligatory. Its collected brutalities are in the sideboard. And it had it doesn't have all the little extra stuff like the Blessed Alliance and the Kitchen Finks. You know, it's got extra Fulminator Mage instead. But my point is that it's not surprising to see a deck like this. That, it, and it looks like a good deck. It looks like a good build. It's just, it's tough. I think that I would want my Obzon deck to beat Burn, and I think this one's going to have a lot harder uh, time. That's a, this is a great contrast, Patrick. But this we were talking about Nunez's deck being challenging for a Burn deck to beat. Uh Alberto Galicia's Absent Midrange is exactly the kind of deck that you want to play against when you're playing uh, a burn deck. Uh, a couple of a couple of maybe less intuitive things about the the matchup. If you look at it, he has Maelstrom Pulse. Any deck with Maelstrom Pulse is pretty easy to beat for a couple of reasons. One of them is it costs three, and all your threats cost one or two, and so they're just always behind if they draw that card. Uh, but separately, most of the fast removal, Abrupt Decay, Fatal Push, um, not Fatal Push, sorry. Abrupt Decay, Dismember, Go for the Throat. Even the instants that cost uh, about two are very inefficient against Goblin Guide and um, and Monastery Swift Spear. So those creatures have haste and they only cost one. So even if you're getting like a decent one for one, you're usually eating like four damage on the way. And so you're always a little bit behind. And then you're just trying to survive long enough to get Kalidus online or something. At that point, they, they typically have the flexibility to play cards like um, skull crack or you're just taking a ton of damage because these these other cards uh that you're playing are so inefficient like dismember in particular is really inefficient against well them. that's that's actually the one i wanted to highlight was uh having dismember instead of path to exile is brutal against goblin guy it's really really bad like i mean just for that matchup of course yeah just for that matchup but uh just in general not having white mana you might be tempting to think oh because uh Alberto doesn't need to go find white mana. It might be that his mana is better or easier or whatever. I disagree. We're talking about uh, four tectonic edges. His mana is actually worse. The four tectonic edges, I think it's just so brutal when you have to play against a... If, you, if you're playing four tectonic edge where uh, Nunez has a planes, two shambling vents... And a, a blooming marsh. I guess not blooming marsh. They both have the same number. But a plains, two shambling vents, and then like an extra fetch land or something. Ah, uh, okay, that just the, seems the lack of basic stumble. planes in this deck is really it's brutal. Like you just, it, it's similar to what we were talking about Becky's deck. You literally just want to fetch for the basic planes sometimes. And you know if you just have to get the temple garden, and that's the only way that you're gonna you know be able to cast your lingering, lingering souls. souls or whatever you're. You're just so far behind. Like, your card quality in Abzan versus Burn is obviously, it's like three times as high as the Burn deck. But the problem is, if you're dead before you can cast those cards, it's that's not productive. So, uh, in the finals uh, over there, Steve uh, Hato, uh, Hato had a, uh, a little bit different of an Abzan deck. An Abzan deck splashing only for lingering souls and then realizing that they don't want the lingering souls and cutting lingering souls <laughs> so just straight black green the rock is, yeah but this is a different style this is going back to dark confidant eternal witness main deck kitchen finks multiple tireless trackers this is like actually playing a rock style i mean this of- is just like like saul malka would just put his stamp of approval on this like this is exactly like all my guys are just value guys. Dark Confidant, Tireless you, Tracker, like Eternal Witness. We're just all a little bit better than we were a second ago. Dude, so what do you think of the one Ramen Up Excavator in the sideboard? Four Fulminator Mages and a Ramen Up Excavator. Huh. I, I wouldn't have thought to play it. That's, 
I don't know. Like, I guess it's great uh, with all these fetch lands, right? You so you say that, but the second biggest deck of the weekend, the second biggest deck of the weekend was actually Scape Shift. So you're saying just the ability to just flip Ghost Quarters is is a uh, is where being you being able be. to. And it, it, you can also grind with it, though, because you keep getting to replay your fetch lands over and over again. Yeah. Like, it's it's a pretty good value card, and if you get it against Scape Shift, or if you get it against, like, any of the Tron decks, that's kind of a nice aspect to the deck, you know? And some of these Death Shadow decks <laughs> run out of basics very fast. Plus, it's it's really not the worst to be able to uh, defend yourself perpetually against Ink Moth and Blink Moth Nexuses. Oh, I like that a lot. Well, the one thing I would I'd comment about two things about the mana base. One of them is it, just taking a note from the uh, the Jeskai deck we looked at earlier. If you're in for three hissing quagmire, would you be in for four hissing quagmire? Right, like this deck, every other land potentially comes into play untapped in this in this mana base. That's, that's, what do you think about that one? Well, you can only play three before they start coming in to play tapped. <laughs> huh? Because <laughs> on the fourth turn. Oh, it's Hiss and Quagmire. I'm he thinking a, of Blooming he has, Marsh. No, he has four Blooming Marsh. Yeah, okay. So yeah, I'm just well, like, I'm just I think like, that's great. Well, yeah, but I mean, every other land has the potential at least of coming to play untapped. I, I'm just thinking, I think if you're in for three, I think I'd be in for four. I, I don't know. Um, but that's one thing. And then separately, what do you think about the one scavenger grounds? I like one scavenger ground. I do think that you're kind of you're you're kind of greedy when you have to play when you're playing four colorless lands in your twenty three land deck that's also supporting Liliana and Eternal Witness and so on. It's a little greedy. I'm not. It is a little greedy. There, it doesn't have any synergy with anything but else. The thing, and the thi- I, I, I would I just, sooner play a fourth ghost quarter. That's that's where I was going with this. Is that I actually think the scavenger grounds is okay. I I just think that I might want the fourth ghost quarter instead if I really have if I can support that. The thing I did want to mention though is I think that there's some merit to Treetop Village too. You got to keep an eye on Treetop Village. I I don't know that I always love four Hiss and Quagmire because they really start to stack up where you just can't like you you get diminishing returns. And I frequently it doesn't mean you can always do it, but I frequently. Uh, I'm in the market for a treetop village instead of the fourth is in quagmire or other various analogs, you know, that is an inspiring statement. I have to say about treetop village. I mean, I could actually imagine some version of the metagame where you're playing in excess of four treetop villages and, and hissing quagmires, maybe in a right of the night of the reliquary build. Um, and that, it, but you know, the metagame has to be cooperative with you. Luckily, there's probably some version of the metagame that is, right? Like, we've seen at least three different takes on the metagame. Well, I mean, both Nunez and uh, uh, Galicia uh, had a tr- uh, treetop village or two in their lists, but I think it's a different equation uh, when you're doing this ghost quarter recursion thing. Although, I guess, to be fair, Alberto did have four Tectonic Edge and two Treetop Village, but I just don't know how, you know, I, I, that just seems like you're really stretching. No, I mean, I, don't, I mean that, like, that there's some version of the metagame that not just Treetop Village is accommodated, but that you could play in excess of four, right? Treetop oh, yeah. Villages and Hissing Quagmire. So that's like, probably not eight, right? But, but uh, yeah. more than four. Yeah, I think you can. Julian Ray's Obs on deck, obviously completely different style, but Obs on counters, like the counters company uh, at the uh, at the GP. Um, no, no actual creature lands, but uh, I did want to point out a couple pieces of tech that were kind of sweet. Ronus the Indomitable. What do you think about Ronus the Indomitable? Uh, I love it. You, so, like, of course, the trick here. I mean, obviously, you can Ronus the indomitable for value just to like give them the business but the trick here is that it's an alternative win condition besides walking ballista that allows you to leverage your uh arbitrarily large amount of green mana yep and when you court of calling you can't just court of calling for a walking ballista right like you can it's just very ineffective (laughs) and so there's some is there some version of reality where it won't die like a yeah yeah, there is, but it's not in this deck. 
Yeah. This deck's not doing it. But uh, there are some cards you could play if you really wanted to. But it's nice that, um, like, okay, so normally what happens is you can go Cord and you go get Duskwatch Recruiter, and then you just recruit her all the way through your deck and find your Ballista. Right? But sometimes you don't want it to come to that. You know, like... I mean, you, some, just, you might be needled for Ballista. Or for, for, um, you could easily be needled for Ballista. Yeah, for ballista. Your, your opponent could have... Uh, you're, in this case, your walking ballista might already be gone, right? Like, I mean, I guess you could just eternal witness it a lot, but if it gets exiled, either way, the point is that having an extra kill card, um, it's kind of interesting. You know, like for instance, what if somebody puts down the the white ley line, right? You can't even walking ballista their face anymore. Yep, that could easily happen. And if you just have Ronus the Indomitable, you can, you know, yeah, way just... over the top. There's, like, super subtle stuff, right? Like, there's a selfless spirit in this deck, for example, which flies, right? So you might just have a flyer in play, and then you're like, all right, I have an arbitrarily large amount of mana. I can just go get it and attack them. Uh, you just have multiple creatures, right? Multiple creatures attack them. Uh, I think that there are many cases uh, that weren't aren't too tough to think of where Ronus the Indomitable is actually better than Walking Ballista, right? Um, yeah, depending on what the opponent's playing. You can just cast it and give people the business. Yeah, I think it's great. I think uh, it's. I think it's probably cool to see in action. Also, that's a uh, to to the degree that 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 matters. You know, magic is, is part spectator sport. Also today, it's a tough. It's a tough break. It's unfortunate. It is dissynergy. But noble hierarch and Ronus the Indomitable are not the best of friends. They curve pretty good. One into three. But it's it's real hard to get your exalted triggers and Ronus the Indomitable working together. <laughs> uh, what do you think of the Counters Company deck in uh, general? I'm- I like it. Um, uh, it's like that that version. Of, I mean, the previous version was already a solid archetype. Right now, it's it's tougher and you know more more layered and has more things going on. It's faster. Uh, potentially anyway i don't know i think it's it's definitely a deck i would consider playing if i were not a burden zombie i think it's what i would play if we had to play with 180 card decks why specifically 180 card decks i think that by the time you get to like 225 or so i think battle of the wits Battle's starts seeming a little better yeah but i think at 180 it's it's battle of the wits is a tough way to do it and i think that uh whenever i go to build these these combo decks with like this vizier of remedies and the saraseer and malira and anafenza it's always like jesus when i first sketch it out it's like a hundred the first 165 are easy you know it's the, the last 15 s- slots that, that that's where the customization comes in all right so some stuff i understand right um if you look at the sideboard of this deck Linvala Keeper of Silence, uh, your good friend and mine, Brian Cole, oh, yeah. once, once declared this the worst card that was ever printed. Like It just like completely blanks the other guy's deck, right? It's pretty easy to get into play quickly, even with one copy. Uh, you know, I get Birds and Forge Tender. You know, that's a card that you really might not want to see, depending on your matchup on the other side of the table. Idle onto the Rhetoric. You know, it could help shut down Storm. You know, Quasali Pride Mage, it's a bullet. Same with Reclamation Sage. They're actually bullets that are good against the same kind of stuff. Jailers and Scavenging Oozes are are, are producing, you know, very similar kinds of uh, effects against Graveyard. What about Mirren Crusader? So that is Mirren, a weird bullet to me. I don't know, man. I think Mirren Crusader is great. I mean, first of all, it's totally fine as a 2, 3, or 4 in a variety of decks. It's just a great card. But uh, as a bullet, it actually makes a lot of sense to me. The big thing is that you can only really use it as a bullet in a deck that has so many random donks laying around that you're not afraid of Liliana of the Veil. <laughs> and when you're playing a deck with uh, Voice of Resurgence, Kitchen Finks, stuff like that, in addition to birds and hierarchs yeah, and so on. Just all the dum-dums are just getting in line to die. <laughs> uh, it just donks on parade, right? Like, But... What you do is you go get Mirren Crusader against these black green decks. You know, like when, like for instance, if and Obzon, you know, like if you if you play uh, if you play a Mirren Crusader against like Alberto's list from earlier, his removal is two abrupt decay, two dismember, three fatal push, a go for the throat, two maelstrom pulse, 
And then his big plan ends up being for Liliana of the Veil, which we already discussed getting around, and then block with lingering souls. That's the big plan, is to try to block with lingering souls. I mean, you can only do that, like, 16 times or so, right? My only issue is that the people who are playing all these decks that Mirror and Crusader is so good against, they all board in flaying tendrils and damnations. <laughs> That's already what they're doing. That, that's their thing against you. That's kind of my point. I think some of these cards, like Linvala, I get it. You hit Linvala in the right matchup, they're just toast, right? Like their best case scenario is there's a seven turn clock in play, right? And they're 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 not even going to find a way to stop it, right? At Reclamation Sage and Kasali Pride Mage, they can be fast. They can like they can take out the thing you need to take out quickly. They can. They enable you to keep playing magic, and you've got a powerful combo in your deck potentially. But like Mirror and Crusader, like I get it. It's got double strike. You probably can swing for six with a noble hierarch and play. That's cool, dude. Ronus, man. Yeah, I think this is. I th- I think the ambition of Mirror and Crusader is going to exceed its uh, its efficacy. <laughs> yeah, me too. I like uh, him. I just don't think I'd put him in my seventy five. I would put him in my 75 if I was playing a different 74. I just think that this is a tough spot for him. Uh, but what do you think of the other uh, collected company style? I mean, I guess technically there were a couple because there was some Eldrazi action. But the specifically the Grand Prix champion, uh, Le- Lelis, yep. who played uh, the, the, the Bant Coco deck. So this is a Nightfall deck. Uh, it, its defining characteristic is uh, Retreat to Coral Helm and Knight of the Reliquary. We've talked about this deck before, I think. Um, yeah, but I'm saying I love Mirren Crusader here. And in fact, he features three well, in his three. sideboard. Yeah, I love it here. Because it's also very on message, right? Like, when your opponent... Because it, it, you don't need to just use it against Black Green and Abzan and decks like this. You could, at a certain point, it's like, okay, well, I, against Jund, their Lightning Bolt could already get it, but their Lightning Bolt's going to get its money anyway. You're talking about a deck that has Spell Queller, Tireless Tracker, Thalia, Knight of the Reliquary. Like, there's Spirit. Like, right. But that and so that's part of it. Lightning Bolt attracting machine. Right. And when you have Mirren Crusader with the ability to protect it some with cards like Selfless Spirit. Uh, or, you know, I, the, the tempo from Thalia also matters too, but I also just think this deck is much, much better equipped to play sort of a backup grind. It's not like you're tutoring it up. I mean, you are with Collected Company, right? I think this deck has a legitimately scary plan B. Like, look at the creatures it's got. Plan B? It's legitimately scary. Plan B is comboing off. So you just think, like, it's, it's standard Bant beatdown is its plan A? Yes. It's not the flashy one. It's not where you're getting the headlines. Nobody wants the autograph of its plan A, but its plan A is beats. I mean, yeah, like these are these are not even the most mediocre beats. You could do a lot worse than selfless spirit, spell queller, tireless tracker, Thalia, Knight of the Reliquary. How these many are people some... do you think he gets with just like Knight of the Reliquary, tireless tracker? A lot. That combo is fantastic. That combo That's... is unreal, right? Like combo is fantastic, and you get them both. You collect a company and your opponent's end step on tap. Next thing you know, everything gets very real very quickly. How high can you count? Because that's how much damage is coming. It's, it's, oof. I mean, just straight up, it's already fantastic, right? Like you're sacking the Knight of the Reliquary, or you're sacking the land to Knight of the Reliquary, getting a fetch land, cracking the fetch land, getting another land, playing a land for the turn. So, like, straight up, it's already doing a lot. However, Tireless Tracker is also a combo piece because whenever you have Retreat to Coral Helm and Knight of the Reliquary, you can just go get all the land out of your deck. And then your Tireless Tracker just kills them outright. It's because of Tireless Tracker that he doesn't even need to play a Wolf Run. There's no Kessig oh, Wolf Run in this there's deck. There's no Wolf Run in this deck. That's because he, that Tireless Tracker is that good. All right, so... I am going to nitpick about one thing about that thing. Defense. That said, you can also, the step is good too, because the fact that you get to step uh, to, to be able to get your Knight of the Reliquary through some percentage of the time, that helps. That helps round out the edges. That's actually a the card I was going to complain about. I used to love it in standard when there was two steps in the Knight of the Reliquary decks, but I actually did, didn't like the step as much in this deck. 
But I guess I just I think you need one. You need something to go get. So yeah, if all you have through. is the night, yeah. if all you have is the night, you want to have something. It doesn't have to be step. It could be something else. It doesn't have to be forcing through the night. You just need to be able to profit from all this. Because I mean, you're gonna have tons of mana, but you don't always have something to spend it on. Now, I don't think you need it to be a wolf run. You could have it be wolf run if you really wanted to. Yeah, but but wolf run kind of... does complicate the mana base. That's the thing. Yeah, it does. But I think you need something. The you do township need something. A- accomplishes a similar thing no nah, it's different the township is fantastic it's unbelievable it's like the best one but it's not for this purpose i just think that if you're doing the combo you need to have a land that you end with you need a final note um uh, what do you think about phyrexian revoker in the sideboard eh, it's okay uh i don't know i mean i like being able to to uh cocoa up my pivy needles if, to me, it's just like when the Cavs have Dante Jones on their bench for the playoffs every year. Like he's never in the like the the main deck. He's just they just always like put him on the team with like three games to go or whatever. Just like why? It's just like sort of low impact card relative to everything else that it has going on. I don't yeah, know. I don't know. You need some kind of interaction. It has counter spells. It has. I think fracturing gust is is pretty exciting. Dude, I just want to get Reflector Mage in decks like this. Yeah? It's not banned yeah. in Modern. I know. That tracker is so impressive. The Spell Quellers have got to be brutal in this deck. Yeah, Spell Queller seems amazing here. I love Tracker here. I could play four trackers here. I could picture playing four trackers. I love Tireless Tracker in, in the band deck. Isn't it cool how Tireless Trackers had this career? Tireless Trackers played in Legacy. Legacy. Oh, yeah. I, I saw people play Legacy. Vintage. It's got in Land's deck. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, Tyros Tracker is a fan. It, I mean, it's a, it's a messed up magic card. I saw a hapless lands player sideboard in Tireless Tracker against uh, Black Red Reanimator this week. I was just like, is that good? I was like, no, it, it's better than what I had. <laughs> well, so uh, here's some tech for you. Just narrowly missing the top eight. Uh, Guillaume per per bet uh, over in Birmingham uh, playing Dredge. With two driven to despair in his main deck. Wow. So two driven to despair in his dredge place, deck. The, the worst, best, worst uh, place you can be in a Grand Prix. Um, driven to despair is a, a black green aftermath split card. Uh, driven is a one in a green sorcery. Until end of turn, creatures you control gain trample. And whenever this creature deals combat damage to a player, draw a card and then despair is one in a black with aftermath um also a sorcery until end of turn uh creatures you control gain menace and whenever this creature deals combat damage to a player that player discards a card likely this is to be played from the graveyard right oh yeah that's the primary plan a is playing uh despair from the graveyard because uh you can both flip it over to like your dredging you know, all that Stinkweed Imp action, Golgari Thug action. but you Or you can discard it to Cathartic Reunion, Faithless Looting, A Haunted Dead, any of that action, Insulin Neonate. But uh, one of the things that it does is give you a very powerful form of disruption. It makes it so that uh, that Blood Gas, that Insulin Neonate, that Narc Amoeba, all those things, the prized amalgam, it's easy to, it's easy for a deck like this to be a turn too slow. It can very consistently be a turn too slow. And the turn before it loses, it has four or five dorks in play. <laughs> and if you could just despair to mind twist your opponent, you could win outright. You just need a little time. You just need a little time. What do you think about mana confluence in this deck? 20 lands, it? 20% of them are mana confluence. Dude, how often are you even tapping your lands? I don't know. For sure, on the first turn. What I wonder is why is mana confluence... Like, like mana confluence cannot be so much better than City of Brass that it's just like, oh, I'm in for any number of mana confluences. But City of Brass, no. That's where I gotta draw the line. You never know when somebody else might have an Urborg or whatever, right? Like, what... Why would is four exactly the right number? What about five? What about playing one city of brass? <laughs> I mean, 
What about three? I I don't know. I think that I I would not be gravitating towards any kind of mana confluence slash city of brass. Cards. It's because all you think about is lava spike. Oh. No. It's not. I I was and very happy to play family, mana and confluence in standard, right? But like, I don't think you gain that much in this archetype with it. That's all. Like there, I guess he's not. You're. I, I mean, you're a lot of colors, right? Like yeah, I guess in, he's gemstone like, mine. And, yeah, I mean, like, in this spot, uh, it, it lets, I guess, it enables uh, splashes of everything, right? Like, I mean, is there any color he doesn't have? No, I mean, it's weird. It's like main color he's casting spells from is red, right? Like, it's weird because you think of this as a black deck, but you don't actually cast I the don't. black cards very much. Nah. Yeah, I mean, sometimes you got to, but that's not where you're really trying to go. I mean, you definitely don't want to cast Vengeable Pharaoh. But, uh, I you mean, could. I don't, With all those you mana confluences, you could actually get him out. But there's a lot of eight. stuff in this deck that you're not planning on casting. You're just going to cast it when the situation calls. Like, sometimes you're like, ah, I wasn't planning on playing Narc Amoeba, but it's come to this. Or, oh, I, you know, like, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't planning on needing this extra double red for Conflagrate, but I'm glad this is just a untapped source. You know, obviously, you got to cast green, you got to cast black, you got to cast red. In my experience, it comes down to conflagrate a lot. Just, oh, yeah. Like, half the games just end on that, which is, I think, non intuitive because it seems like such a creature deck. They just brain you for six, like, fairly often. Because the it's pretty easy to just fill your hand with cards with life from the loam. And then while you're filling your hands with cards from life from the loam, you're actually just digging your conflagrate into the graveyard. Like, uh, here's a bunch of damage. Uh, were there any other uh, any other big decks this weekend that you really wanted to uh, focus on? I think I think the maybe the just a the black green Tron deck. Sure. So. Oh, I got one more too. By the way. Yeah, I I thought that the the black green Tron deck um, because we you know red green Tron was the was the order of the day not that long ago and then. Uh, Tom Ross kind of went with the green white Tron. Uh, and then we saw even mono green Tron. I uh, just wonder what you think about the black green versus some of those other color combinations. Uh, I mean, if you're going to play uh, like the green X style of, of Tron, uh, I personally like the green black. Um, I mean, I think green white is also on the table. I wouldn't want to play mono green or green red. But uh, I think green black's okay. I, I I like collective brutality. Yeah, it's really just a question of fatal push and collective brutality versus fog, right? Like that's like a pretty strong upgrade versus fog. Yeah, I mean I don't think that's really the comparison though. I still think path to exile and you know I think the white is sort of the. Well, no, no, I, I mean think... obviously the mono green version has fog versus yeah. path to exile. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I I just I think collective brutality is just too good for Tron to uh to pass up if you're going to go the green x tron rep then what do you think about the creature mix like so world breaker ulamog ceaseless hunger and thought not seer are all cards that weren't even available to tron decks not that long ago right these are all in the last two years uh you know we, we saw mostly karn liberateds uh and then maybe worm coil engines before uh these are very very different threat base like i mean just legitimately casting world breaker i guess thought not seer seems kind of non-intuitive to me uh, I don't know. I, I think it also stacks really nicely with all the collective brutalities. Like once you have four collective brutality, the two thought not seers following them up, you know, it, that's kind of nice as an additional, uh, you know, form of disruption. And this is really a different style of Tron than some of the previous ones. It's a little lower to the ground, and it's um, the fact that you're not going all the way to like Emrakul or whatever. You're you're just going to Ulamog. But you've actually got World Breaker as sort of a mini Ulamog. You know, that's kind of interesting. And then uh, two Fatal Push and four Collective Brutality together is a is a lot more cheap interaction than sometimes we see. And yeah. then... Uh, I think I, I would be apt to play Dismember instead of Fatal Push in the main deck. Is that... I don't know. I like Fatal Push better, personally. They're very different, though, right? They like, are very different. One of them can kill a Reality Smasher. And the other one can't. I'm not, dude, I'm not dismembering Reality Smasher if I'm playing Tron. <laughs> it's pretty horrible, right? Like, 
<laughs> you basically take the reality smasher hit and have to discard. <laughs> but I'm saying you could do it. <laughs> it's happened. Deep thoughts with Michael Flores. What do you think of uh, the Death Shadow deck? I mean, we would be remiss to not at least touch on the Death Shadow deck. And I think the highest finishing one was uh, Mopesto in uh, in Brazil with a uh, a version that isn't exactly too exotic, but does feature main deck stubborn denials as well as those disdainful strokes in the sideboard that we love so much. Yeah, I think that um, you know one of the things I've enjoyed is the kind of the movement from the Jund Death Shadow decks uh, to the Grixis Death Shadow decks. And I think that Stubborn Denial is awesome in this archetype. Uh, in fact, I think as many as four in the main deck is awesome. Uh, it's cause so easy for them to get it in a position where it's just a hard counter for, for one mana. Um, you know, Street, street Wraith is very good here. It's not always played. Um, I don't know. Like this is It's crazy to not play Street Wraith in Death it, Shadow. Yeah, but people don't always play it. It's crazy. It's happened. I know. I mean, especially I when you're playing like Tassiger and and Gurmag Angler, like it's just freebies. But uh, what do you think, think of By Force? That one kind of caught me. I'm, I'm I'm not sure how to feel about By Force. It's kind of surprising. It feels like it's surprising to me that that would be the most efficient. I mean, I don't well, know. So it, this is like a. It's weird because this is like a a blunt force um, sideboard card, right? But it's it's there for a specific reason, right? Like. If you want to destroy X artifacts, probably aiming this against Affinity. But if you only want to destroy one, it's the same casting cost as a Shatter, right? That's not it's not too too bad. I, I think this is a very, very efficient card if you're playing it specifically against Affinity. Yeah, I, so the fact that buy force is like so... It's so much easier to buy force for two than to Shatter Spree Kick. And it's not like sh- by force for one is that much worse than Shatter Spree unkicked. Um, I don't know. Uh, Shatter Spree, I mean, it though. Depends, being... like, Shattering Spree is better against decks that have blue, right? Like, that, that's well, one. But, like, it, I so, don't think it matters that much in modern. So the thing is that, like, you can only Shattering Spree for up to three, right? Like, you've got Steam Vents and two Blood Crypts. But you can also do it relative. I guess you don't want to have to fetch up red land. I don't know, man. Three red land, yeah, that's that's tough. I, I think this card. I think this is a surge. It's, cool, it's like a good. surgical, blunt force object. I think I'm into it. As a guy who's who's destroyed more than my fair share of people with uh, rack and ruin, I'm into my. I'm into buy force. Yeah, this is like exactly rack and ruin on three, just sorcery speed, right? Right. But uh, dude, if only we had meltdown. It's kind of mm. weird to me that Grix is said. I mean, I think is it fair to say that most people would just if you say, "Okay, what's the best second modern?" Most people would just say probably Grix is set shadow. That that it didn't win any of the tournaments, right? Right. I don't even think it made a finals. Um. Well, so what happened? How come it's not it's not on top in any tournaments? It had a lot of at bats this week. So Patrick. Yep. So on the subject of some of these artifact destruction cards. What do you think about just playing two copies of Colgan's Command main deck and then no more Colgan's Command? It seems like one of the best cards in the mirror match to me. Like, when I've played the Grixis matchups, like, Colgan's Command Snapcaster Mage was, like, one of the most important things that I could that I could pull off to gain advantage against the other Grixis player. And then separately, you know, you were making the comment that Colgan's Command is awesome against, against Shrine of Burning Rage. Would you bring in any of your by force or ceremonious rejection or even engineered explosives against um, Shrine of Burning Rage? I, I don't think I would. No, yeah, I would not. Now, on the other hand, if I had access to subterranean tremors, <laughs> subterranean tremors. What is that? X in a red. Uh, sorcery subterranean tremors deals X damage to each creature without flying. If X is four or more, destroy all artifacts. If X is eight or more, put an eight-eight red lizard creature token onto the battlefield. The market is now closed. Wow, dude, this was a conspiracy card. It's legal and legacy. It's legal and legacy. It's like the horsemanship sweeper. It's like, 
you know, or, but I guess it doesn't hit players. But being able to just like play subterranean tremors as a sweeper and then being able to kick it as a shatter storm. Plus, when the game really stretches out, you can use it as a kill card. This kind of reminds me of, like, when I'm playing blue-white and I have so many creature removal cards in my deck that I can't side enough of them out. And I'm like, am I really willing to bring in Descend Upon the Sinful to get the 4-4 for 6? And then I just look at all of my types are just instant. That's what I think of with your subterranean tremors. Yeah. I just, I would like to see that card in modern. That one in days. And then we're Days? Yeah, yeah, Days is a fun card, dude. I think that, dude, I would like Days in Modern. At least I, I think I would like it. I think that you're gonna like Days in Modern intellectually the same way like you like Gitaxian Probe in Modern. No, I do not like Gitaxian Probe in Modern. Do you remember when we I played play Mental Min- Misstep? I, that lasted a long time. Yeah, I mean, Mental Misstep was pretty stupid, but yeah, <laughs> Days is the same. Like these, are, all these cards have something in common. They're blue and they don't cast it cost anything. Hmm. Well, uh, nevertheless, modern is thriving. Millions of decks, everything. You know, we didn't even touch on all the different Blood Moon decks and Eldrazi Tron and uh, Boggles and Elves and all sorts of stuff. Fairies, a couple fairy decks showed up. There's there's all kinds of stuff. So I'm excited. But I'm also excited for GP Denver this weekend, and hopefully uh, we'll run into lots of you guys at home. Except not at home, because I'm not at your home right now, and hopefully not this you'll, weekend they'll be either. Hopefully, towards your home. hopefully you'll come towards my home and kick it at the uh, GP. And uh, hopefully, uh, you know, I can help uh, remind people that there is always a greater power. Awesome. So, uh, we're Top Level Podcast. I'm Michael J. Flores. And I'm Patrick Chapin. Thank you guys every week for following us, for sharing us on, uh, on social media, the likes, the, the follows, the Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, Patreon, and in particular, Patreon, helping make it possible for us to bring the show to you guys every week. Yep. Uh, this week, we'd like to thank Jesse McMinn from Patreon. Thanks a lot, Jesse. Yeah, major props, Jesse. So, um... Thanks for supporting us. Thanks for sharing. And uh, thanks for listening. Rad. Okay, guys. See you guys in uh, Denver. Bye-bye. Pussy life didn't work so great. Tried to play dredge for jail or hate. Ghostly prison waiting for my untapped phase. Your core trapped in amber stasis, please. Lost a lot of friends, got left behind. Had to find a way not to lose my mind. Trapped in a vault with nothing but time. Parents and my friends.